Next we get into the basics of social media sites and this is a little bit more detailed and I know you will be going over this in, in subsequent modules um, and so I don't want to cover them too much but uh, in general what I tell students to start out with is Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. They're the most popular. I call them the big three um, and I know that Dale will cover these more in depth as we go so I don't want to cover them too much but then I also cover Snapchat, Tumblr, and Pinterest and basically what I'm doing here here in this lecture is I'm talking about how to use each one of these sites specifically um, the way that they were created to be used um, and so um, Gary Vaynerchuk is a um, an author and he is going to be talked about in future modules but he talked about this idea of making sure that your content is native to the platform and he says today getting people to hear your story on social media and then act on it requires using a platform's native language paying attention to context understanding the nuances and subtle differences that make each platform unique and adapting your content to match and that's basically what I think a lot of the rest of this whole um, teaching social media um, workshop will be focused on making sure that the content that we're providing is native to each platform and we're going to get more into the details of that later and really what we're talking about here and especially in the FDOM class is making sure that they're using each one of these social media sites to most effectively send people back to their website or blog or in this case it's their blog and so it's really a chance for them to figure out which site is most effective in getting new visitors um, and how can I start using these uh, platforms to, to, to garner new engagement. So uh, then we move into online business models where we talk about a few different ideas. Uh, the first is we talk about the long tail and that was kind of coined by Chris Anderson and he's the former CEO of Wired Magazine um, and he really had and this is also provided in this online module um, for anybody who's more interested but really the basics are that um, in the online digital marketplace uh, we have uh, unlimited shelf space uh, when somebody goes to Walmart to buy a CD for example um, there's only so much space on the shelf uh, and so they have to sell the hits uh, whereas in the online marketplace there is no shelf space there's unlimited shelf space um, and so you don't have to just sell the hits, you can sell the misses of the industry as well. And he uh, posits in this uh, idea that really online business marketers, can, online business places can make more money on the misses of the industry, on the B-sides, uh, the, the, the harder to find um, items than they could even on the hits because there's such a long tail of unique niche uh, products that really if you do if you create a platform in which anyone can upload uh, these niche products you can make a killing on all the different unique products I mean look at Amazon uh, and, 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 and eBay and uh, iTunes and, and all these platforms uh, like Etsy um, I mean they're just limitless and they're popping up everywhere because um, what online businesses are finding out now is that they can make more money a lot of times on misses or or not so popular items uh, they can make more money on the the vast amount of them just on the sheer amount of them uh, versus selling a few of the hits and so that's really what he's talking about and on on the coattails of that um, he talks about free as well a couple years later he came out with this article and you can uh, read the article as well um, but he talks about the idea that really everything in the online marketplace is and, and is free in a lot of ways I mean the music industry realized this on the onset of Napster uh, but uh, you know not many people are paying for news when they can go find it somewhere else and so he says um, let's not worry too much about paywalls and trying to make people pay for things why don't we give away free things and make money another way and so he you know just using the music as an example um, if bands gave away their music for free uh, then they can make money on merchandise they can still make money on live appearances they can make money on um, you know concerts you know sell people tickets to having concerts at their own houses and make music an experience again and so he says if we use something like that like a model 
uh, that the music industry is using, maybe news could do the same thing, or maybe any industry can do the same thing. And so he talks about this is the world of free economics. Um, it's the world where if you give something away for free, you can make it back uh, another way. So one form of this is freemium. And you can read the article and kind of and go through each one of these different p uh, pieces of free economics, but freemium is the example of that like for Dropbox. Uh, Dropbox users all get five gigabytes for free if you've ever used Dropbox.com. Um, and so uh, if you want more, you will have to pay. Okay, so you get a, a, a certain amount for free, but everybody else who pays above that is really paying for the structure of, of Dropbox to be used. And they're, they're making money on giving away free space. Although a few people are paying money for a premium account, that's where the freemium comes from. Everyone gets some for free, but some people, if they want to pay for premium, they, they can basically support the structure. So there's lots of different models out there, um, and that was just one that we talk about. Um, Gary Vaynerchuk, who was discussed earlier as well, talks about how the idea that his legacy is greater than currency. Um, he basically talks about how um, he, he cares more about his legacy as a person than he does about money. and and he really focuses on the idea that if you are, if you love your users, if you treat them well, if you, um, you know, uh, provide good quality content um, and have a good legacy, you can leverage that into all kinds of, of, of things and ways to make money. For example, um, what he does is he uses um, his legacy as a social media titan <laughs> to do social uh, speaking engagements and he makes money that way. Um, he's also leveraged it into writing books and he makes money that way. Although he gives away a lot of content for free online, he gives lots of good advice. He's a social media um, guru who really, um, he does make money in other ways. And, and he says he focuses mostly on his legacy and what, what strategically he can do to build a good personal brand. And then once your brand has lots of value, you can then leverage that in lots of different ways to make money. Uh, any way you can. Another form of online business model, these online business models that we're studying is um, Amanda Palmer. She's a musician and she has obviously built a really, really great brand for herself and in, in the quality of content that she's putting out in terms of music. Um, but she also um, asks people for money. And so she uses uh, platforms like Kickstarter to ask her fans who are already very passionate. Um, it's the ask model. Um, and she's made a lot of money just by asking her passionate fans. And the Texas Tribune has the same model. They'll ask people, obviously, for donations. Um, there's lots of different ways. If you have a, a good following, a passionate community of people that are following you, think about bands, you know, uh, think about a lot of bands that if they just ask their fans for money, a lot of times fans will pay. So those are just a few online business models. Other uh, businesses, uh, business models that we talked about. Then uh, we move into the world of uh, mobile and apps, and I go through just some basic stats taken from the Pew Internet um, research uh, website. 64% uh, of American adults own a smartphone. Uh, these numbers are, are just growing. 42% of American adults own a tablet. 67% of cell owners find themselves checking their phone for messages, alerts, or calls, even when they don't notice their phone ringing. I, I'm guilty of that for sure. 44% uh, of cell users have slept with their phone next to their bed. Basically what we talk about is mobile phones and mobile technology is really uh, more of an extension of ourselves than it is this device that's separate from us, um, like a desktop computer is. And uh, it really is, again, like an extension of who we are. And, and most of the apps that we have on these devices are very near and dear to us. Um, and so we, I just kind of talk about the prevalence of mobile technology and, um, and how these are integrating themselves into our everyday lifestyles. Um, Twenty-nine percent of cell owners describe their cell as something they can't imagine living without. Um, so there's a lot of valuable data here that is also in these in these little devices that that are so so of utmost value. Um, I talk about how there's two kind of roads that you can take if you're going to have an online presence in the mobile world. Um, on the left, you'll see an option, uh, the mobile web, and so um, you can develop your website to be mobile friendly. Uh, which means that um, on any size of device, it will look uh, and feel 
right. It'll feel like it is native to the mobile device itself. I'll give you an example in a second here. And then also apps. Obviously, uh, they're more expensive. Uh, they, uh, they are uh, very niche oriented. Um, but anyway, those are two different worlds that you can enter in the world of, of online uh, mobile presence. Um, responsive sites, you can see, for example, if I was looking at the desktop version of a website and then I looked at the same thing in a browser on my phone, it would kind of re, um, rearrange a lot of the elements of that web page. And so that is a way to make your site mobile friendly. Um, and so that would be called responsive. It's responding to the different size of the browser. That's by far the cheapest, uh, most cost effective way to have a mobile presence. Um, but mobile apps are actually give you a better user experience. Um, they are more niche. They are uh, more specific. Um, and, and every app that you have on your phone is specific to even, even the device that it's on. Um, I mean, think about if your phone did not have connection to the Internet. Um, what characteristics does that phone have? Well, it's got a really great camera. It's got a really great speaker. It's got a keyboard accessibility. So most, I mean, think about any app that you have. Most apps, uh, at least many of them on my phone, are focused on images, uh, videos, or or taking pictures, or um, some kind of photo editing app, you know. Um, and so it is native to the actual platform that it's on. So it has some native functionality. Um, and depending on what device you're using, that will very much depend on what uh, app you're creating and which apps are most successful. Um, it's also very convenient, obviously, with these things are in our pockets. They're everywhere. They're um, on us all the time. And so we want apps, obviously, that will make our lives easier. Um, they're also much better for mobile apps versus a versus a uh, responsive website. Uh, very good for brand loyalty. If you download an app, chances are you're very loyal to that particular brand, and so that's really good for brands to know who's been downloading their site, uh, their their apps, and um, then also I tell students that really apps should solve a problem in some way, um, and so this is all thinking about their, their project in this class to build their own app. And we use a program called Proto.io, that's P-R-O-T-O dot I-O, and you can create your own web, uh, your own mobile app uh, framework, and you can even look at the functionality. You can download the Proto.io app itself, and you can test it out in a browser. There's lots of tutorials that they have, um, and I'll provide some in this, uh, at the bottom of this uh, as well. But that is a great way for them to understand the design, the user experience of a mobile experience, and then um, for them to start thinking about what uses will this app have, um, which apps are different uh, or similar to this one, uh, what problem is it solving, and so that's one of the assignments in this class as well as to build an app. Uh, then we get into the world of digital photography, and as you can see on the right, that is a picture of the um, Hudson River Plain landing. It did land. didn't necessarily crash. Uh, didn't land the way they wanted to, but it did land. Um, and this first photo that was taken from it was from a life raft that was leaving and it was posted to Twitter from one of the people that were in the plane. And so this was a big, obviously, um, interesting moment for social media and showing that citizen journalists um, really bring a lot to the table, especially when they have these these phones in their pockets. Um, so images today, um, as opposed to 20 years ago, are highly shareable um, because of our mobile devices, uh, the virtually limitless number of photos you can take um, thanks to cloud storage and, um, and the accessibility of many SD cards. Uh, it is, you have virtually limitless photos. And then they're very easily editable. We talk about how students can use um, Pixlr is one website, and I'll provide that as well down below. Uh, Pixlr, Photoshop, um, lots of other photo editing websites, even photo editing apps to bring your photos up, um, crop them to br brighten them up or do whatever you need to do to make it a better photo. And then uh, we talk about GIFs versus JPGs. Um, GIFs are graphical interface formats, and those uh, allow the, for movement, animated GIFs. I'm sure you guys have seen those. Um, they're also good for transparent backgrounds. GIFs are generally better for logos. Um, and then, you know, with, with lots of long, big areas of color in them. 
Uh, so almost any logo you see is probably going to be a GIF or even a ping, but it's ne it's usually not a JPEG. JPEGs are more for the photo that you see on the right, um, you know, photos that are actually taken with a camera. And so that's a, one of the differences. We also talk about pixels, uh, megapixels, screen resolution, um, and, and just knowing that pixels are different, just little, the smallest unit of measurement within any photo. Any photo is made up of pixels and the you know the width of pixels times the height of pixels gives you the number of total pixels that are in the photo and megapixel literally stands for million pixels so if the width times the height was like say five million pixels well then you'd have a five megapixel image uh, we also talk about how that is uh, displayed depending on the screen so uh, the if your screen resolution is very high the picture will appear a little bit smaller if uh, the screen resolution is lower, then it will appear larger because those pixels are not uh, scrunched as much on a uh, on a lower resolution screen. Uh, so we talked about that. We talked about composition and when you're taking uh, photos, um, making sure you're using the rule of thirds and basic editing techniques. And again, there's Pixlr.com. Uh, and this is also in relation to a photo slideshow assignment that they have within their blog review theory. The third time that their blog is reviewed, uh, they are required to um, make a photo slideshow and tell a photo story and after, after having edited them within Pixlr. Then we move into online and digital video uh, where we focus a little bit. We start the conversation on traditional broadcast and how um, oftentimes traditional TV stations will just put their content right onto YouTube and often those go viral. Um, there's also ways to use just raw footage and use those in tandem with an online story. Then we also talk about the use of compilation clips. Focus on innovations in video um, as they relate to digital media and um, we talk about live streaming and how that's used even with just the phones in our pockets. Uh, we talk about 360 video and uh, creating a 3D environment, um, uh, drones and how they're used, um, augmented reality, virtual reality, backpack journalism and vlogs. These are all new things that we've seen arise after the onset of digital media and uh, the internet. And so it's exciting to kind of talk about how different media companies like Vice Media um, and Tim Pool are using uh, these technologies to tell stories. Um, and it's exciting to see where it's going. And so um, no longer do we have to just rely on a flat screen, but we can be immersed into a situation um, just through, through a 360 environment or um, augmented reality using the phone in our pockets to hold it up to something and, and experience uh, a story or an advertisement in a way that we never have before. Uh, so we talk about those. We talk about um, the use of you know drones to get footage that you normally couldn't ever have gotten you know without a helicopter 10 years ago. Um, the onset of because we have our phones in our pockets, we can stream, live stream, live events like the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement and, and all kinds of other live events uh, that maybe we, we just didn't have the technology to do uh, for citizen, any normal citizen to do uh, 10 years ago. So we talk about the basics of digital video. And then um, we also talk, they all, all get experience using their phones and digital technology to interview somebody and then um, add B-roll to it and use iMovie to edit that uh, video uh, for an assignment as well. Then we move into data storytelling and I say data storytelling, um, not always data journalism, but um, ways to take data, large amounts of data, we are in the information age, um, to tell stories to people. Um, and this is obviously nothing new, but it's kind of like the days of, you know, having um, just a little bit of data is behind us. Now we have uh, a constant stream of data, whether it's through social media or uh, the amount of data that is um, given to us from the U.S. government and census reports to um, getting our, even our own health data that's given to us from our Fitbits or our Apple Watches or whatever kind of wearable device we're wearing. There's data everywhere and so it's exciting to see all the different opportunities that arise um, not just for journalistic purposes but for advertisers or for PR professionals or for um, electronic media people 
to harness the power of this data to tell a story. Um, that's where our trending comes from when we talk about what's trending on Twitter or um, you see on Spotify how different uh, bands are, are trending. Um, I mean, what music blogger wouldn't want to know which bands are trending before anybody else so they can get the story first? Um, I mean, it's very exciting to see what you can do with just knowing a little bit about data. Um, and so this is kind of just a, a quick run through for them um, as it is for here on this forum um, on data journalism. But um, we talk about APIs, uh, application program interfaces, wh which allow you to tap into these um, large data streams that come from Twitter, Facebook, Google. Um, I mean, the great thing about Google Maps is that they have created, um, they've, they've gathered all this data about street corners and um, you know, taking pictures of your house and, and all this data that they have, um, they don't keep it to themselves, they open it up so that developers and people can create their own um, stories with their data. And so that's what we're talking about when we say APIs, um, you know, Google and Facebook and Twitter and a lot of these sites that have all this data are allowing anybody, uh, even developers, to go in grab the data that they have and tell stories with it. Um, and that's one thing that I do in the class is I um, create an interactive map of where students come from and where and why they went to Texas State. Um, and I'll provide that map as well. Uh, but it really is just using Google Docs. I allow students to fill out a form and then I take all their data and they get interviews with people out on campus and then they um, I map it and I show them how easy it can be to just take a little bit of data, uh, map it, and, and visualize it as well. Um, so I show some examples throughout class. One is how y'all use and you guys talk. This is a quiz put out by the New York Times. It was actually the third, the first <laughs> most viewed uh, of all of the multi of all of the content on the New York Times in 2013, it was the most viewed piece of content above the blast at the Boston Marathon and another story on the uh, Boston Marathon. Um, this is a story that's very shareable. It's a quiz. It's really what it is. It allows anybody to fill out how they talk, you know, if they use uh, the word pop, soda, or, or coke to talk about a beverage. Um, you know, and, you know, do they have a word for a subway, you know, or things like that. And so um, anybody can take it. It was very shareable and so exciting to take all this data about dialects and allow people to not just see that, oh, people in Michigan say pop, but to be able to fill this out on their own and then see where they fall in that map. Um, and so it's a very personalized um world. Um, there's another one called the Cord Cutter's Guide that was put out by The Verge and what's cool about that is that you can calculate what you should pay if you wanted to not, you know, if you wanted to not pay for cable anymore and you wanted to um, start, uh, you just wanted uh, HBO and you just wanted NBC and you just wanted Netflix, how much would you pay? Um, and it shows you how much you would save if you went with these different um, options, but but really again, it's user. The user gets to choose um, using the data. They get to use this infographic, this interactive graphic, to really be able to um, be part of the story instead of just reading a story. Um, same with this rent versus buys put out by the New York Times. It allows you to calculate. Um, how long you need to live somewhere and how much you need to be paying before it's better for you to have rented um, that place versus buying it. Um, and so, it again, it's not just data of, okay, um, how much are houses in this area of New York. It's more, let me put in my income, let me put in how much I want to pay for interest and what area of town I want to live in, press a button, and it will tell you uh, specifically what you should do. Um, there's another fun one called the largest vocabulary in hip-hop. It analyzed the words of different hip-hop artists uh, to see who, uh, which artists had the largest vocabulary. Um, there's another one put out um, in uh, it was the Guardian, but it's cycling in London, um, and, it, and it mapped out on a Google map the severe crashes. Um, so there's lots of different examples of using data to tell stories, um, and we talk about that in class and the importance of that. And finally, we talk about legal and ethical issues. Um, I cover privacy laws and regulations. Um, the 
um, Edward Snowden revelations with NSA. Um, I talk about net neutrality and the importance of being kind of knowing the major players in, in that debacle. Um, I talk about copyright issues and the onset of uh, Napster and music sharing and, and, and even you know copywriting images. A lot of students uh, want to know how they can protect their pictures that they put online. And uh, we talk about Creative Commons, created by Lawrence Lessig. Uh, we talk about the new ethics of journalism, not just legal, but also ethical situations. Um, there's a book put out by Pointer that um, talks about the, you know, the fact that um, because of the digital and online new media environment, um, there's a lot of changing, it's a changing landscape where um, truth obviously is still very much a, a big part of the, the, the ethics of journalists, right? Journalists still desire truth, but now it gets a little bit convoluted when you start working with social media, you know, like how, um, how trustworthy are different sources in, in, uh, in a journalist's search for truth. Uh, if they find a rumor that's, that's uh, I mean, these things are no, not new, it's just that they are, um, on steroids now, you know, um, finding out the, the truth of a rumor can be very, very difficult, um, especially in this online environment. Transparency, um, focusing on the fact that um, now we have lots of digital tools that allow journalists to remain transparent and um, instead of um, just showing a piece of a clip of the president's address, um, you could, as a journalist, show that clip, but then also say, if you want to watch the full thing, click here. And it allows, the online environment allows people to actually experience um, these original documents uh, in a way that we never really have before. Um, but one thing that was unique in, in my study of new ethics of journalism is, uh, it used to be truth, transparency, and minimizing harm. And now that seems like, especially in, in this book on the new ethics of journalism, they talk about how um, really it has kind of transformed into community engagement and thinking more about your community, not just, not just minimizing harm, but thinking about um, the conversation that that you're starting with with articles that you might write, um, being uh, being a part of the community um, to to well inform a community. So just interesting that 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 third um, ethic is is has been transformed from just simply minimizing harm to being a much broader topic. Thanks to the internet. So um, those were just some basics of digital media that we had talked about um, within the. The fundamentals of digital and online media. There's obviously a lot more to cover. There's um, so much that that we can cover in this uh, online module. But um, for the sake of time, um, I would say uh, find those pieces that were of interest to you. Um, there's lots of resources within this module to allow you to um, investigate. Um, if you want to make your own HTML page, if you want to. Um, Learn more about Twitter. There's a there's an option there. There's a New York, New York Times Innovation Report. There's uh, lots of articles down below if you want to learn more about this stuff. But um, definitely a very exciting time for media, and um, I hope you learned a lot in this tutorial. But also uh, that you will learn more even as you go and um, and continue uh, learning throughout the rest of these modules.